Topic for this preliminary session second is flow of philosophical thoughts between India and Far Eastern countries, historical perspective. I will request Chair Professor S. R. Bhatt to come and uh, give his thoughts so that we can proceed with our uh, second preliminary session. Professor S. R. Bhatt. Distinguished delegates, welcome to this uh, special session on flow of uh, Indian philosophical thoughts to far East Asian countries. Philosophizing in India has been quite ancient and also varied. Right from the Vedic uh, thought, our uh, seers, sages, and thinkers have indulged in philosophizing. They have been both intuitive as well as argumentative. On the basis of uh, intuitive realizations, they apprehended the true nature of reality, not this superficial form of reality, but the essence of reality. And that's why we define a rishi as mantra drashta, rishiha mantra drashtaraha. An intuitive apprehension is always holistic, not piecemeal. We apprehend the total reality in all its uh, facets and dimensions. But after having experienced the reality in its totality, we may examine our experiences of reality in a piecemeal manner. And there comes the role of reason and arguments. Reasoning and arg uh, argumentation is not holistic. It is analytical. And it analyzes some part or the other of our experiences. But that is also valuable. In fact, uh, we have uh, in India three steps of philosophizing. I call them as a uh, iksha, anviksha, and pariksha. Iksha stands for uh, intuitive realization. Iksha is also a synonym of drish, to visualize, to apprehend. So we begin with the uh, experience and uh, we, in a again holistic framework, talk of uh, empirical experience as well as uh, trans-empirical experience. And therefore, we make a distinction between two types of knowledge, aparavidya and paravidya. So, we begin with iksha, intuitive realization, and then we reflect upon them. That is known as anu iksha, anviksha. Anu means that which comes after. So, first iksha and then anviksha. Reasoning, argumentation. And uh, this reasoning or argumentation has to be examined. We do not accept any proposition which is unexamined in philosophy. Philosophy is a critical reflection upon our experiences and their examining. So, we have pariksha. Pari samantha, 
we examine our experiences and our analysis of experiences in all its uh, aspects. And that's why we have developed uh, a particular method known as Vad Vidhi for conducting Pariksha. This ancient mode of uh, philosophizing continued even in modern times. And uh, Indian philosophical thought has been so subtle, so, I should say, deep, and also so sublime. In fact, uh, a rishi of the Yajurveda says about Indian philosophy, Sa Prathama Sanskriti Vishwavara. It's the oldest uh, philosophy in the world and is something which should be emulated by the world. It has some inherent uh, vitality, inherent qualities, because of which uh, it is uh, acceptable not only within India but also outside India. And there has been, therefore, the flow of uh, Indian philosophical thought all over Asia. And not only Asia, there was uh, uh, intense uh, interaction with the uh, Greek thinkers also. But since uh, we are presently confined to Asian uh, philosoph mode of philosophizing, we'll uh, just uh, take into account uh, how Indian philosophy and for that matter, Indian culture went outside India. Initially, the Vedic culture, which is the most uh, ancient, went to all Asian countries through sea route. India had uh, a very strong commercial tradition, both uh, in terms of agriculture and uh, industry, and uh, also Indian jewels, pearls, etc., were also exported to other foreign countries, and it was through sea route. Along with the merchants in the boards, the thinkers also went uh, to those uh, foreign countries and propagated Indian philosophy. And that's why we have pockets of uh, adherence of uh, Vedic tradition in, uh, even now in some of the countries of uh, Asia. So it was a uh, Vedic thought which first went abroad and paved the way for the advancement of uh, Buddhism in those countries. In fact, uh, while in uh, Shanghai, I went to a, a library and uh, long back, uh, there was British rule for about uh, 40 years in Shanghai and they had established uh, uh, Royal Asiatic Society of uh, North China. And in that, uh, there was one article which I read, and I have a copy of it still. I have quoted it in my books also. That uh, before the advent of Buddhism, Vedic adherents of Vedic religions were there, and they paved the way for uh, acceptance of uh, Buddhism. And uh, the author has compared Vedic religion with Taoism or Taoism of China. The point therefore is that we had a spread of a Vedic philosophy and thereafter Buddhist thought went and not only Buddhist thought uh, went to these countries, it was uh, modified transformed when it uh, encountered with the local culture of these countries. 
So Buddhism was sinicized in China. We have a different form of Buddhism in Vietnam. We have different form of Buddhism in Korea or in Japan. All these are basically Buddhist, which means the fundamental tenets are the same. But the way these tenets have been expounded and elaborated, there lies the innovation. So we may therefore legitimately talk of Indian Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, Japanese Buddhism, Vietnamese Buddhism, Korean Buddhism, and so forth. There is identity in terms of uh, basic postulates, basic tenets, but there are differences as well in terms of uh, innovative contributions. We have, uh, since we have uh, some uh, uh, scholars from uh, Korea, Professor Lee and others are there. Well, in Korea, there is a legend that uh, in uh, first century, a princess of Ayodhya went to Korea and married King Suru of Korea. And uh, the Kims and the Lees are the descendants of uh, the conjugal relation between uh, the princess of uh, Ayodhya and King uh, Suru of uh, Korea. Well, we India, Indians don't know about it much, but the Koreans know about it. Some of them say it is historical fact. So, some of them say it is just a, a legend, whatever it is. It is well recorded. And uh, a few years back, a team of Korean doctors came to Ayodhya, took uh, the blood samples, compared the blood samples with the uh, Kims of uh, Korea, and found uh, that the genes are were uh, similar. Some sort of af uh, genetic uh, affinity. Uh, in one of my books also I have dwelt on this particular point and we had uh, a few months back uh, a conference in uh, uh, Korea, in Seoul and uh, there uh, I presented uh, this particular perspective but uh, Professor Mishra was also present and he uh, presented another perspective that the princess was from uh, South India not from uh, Ayodhya. Anyway, uh, the popular st uh, story is that uh, the princess is from uh, Ayodhya. In Ayodhya now we have uh, a monument of uh, uh, King uh, Suru and uh, Queen uh, uh, Her. Her Korean name is Her. From Korea, Buddhism went to Japan. And we have another anecdote, written one, docu well documented, wherein uh, the king of uh, Peche sent a letter to the king of Japan saying that uh, Buddhism has directly come from India and uh, it is uh, a religion which is uh, uh, redemptive in nature and therefore must be accepted by Japanese people also for their well-being. In my book, again, I have quoted that particular letter. The point, therefore, is that uh, from India, Buddhism went to not only Sri Lanka or uh, Thailand or uh, Cambodia and uh, Laos and these countries. It also went to Vietnam directly. There were initially good exchanges of scholars between India and Korea. Some people from India went to Korea and some people from Korea came to India to learn Buddhism. And same is the case with Japan also. So from Korea it went to Japan. Of course later on Chinese uh, influence was also there. But my hunch is that it was initially directly it was introduced from India. And it is for the 
researchers now to verify this particular assertion on my part. And I hope uh, young scholars may take up uh, research uh, in this particular area as to how there was a flow of uh, Indian thought, both Vedic and uh, Buddhist, uh, directly from India to these uh, Asian countries. From India, Buddhism went to Tibet and uh, to our uh, great benefit, most of the Buddhist literature produced in India is lost. It was burned when the library of uh, Nalanda was uh, burned. But this, lit uh, li this, uh, uh, menus liter this literature was translated in Tibetan. And exact translation uh, it was possible because we have uh, Mahavyutpatti Shastra which is uh, giving exact equivalent between uh, Sanskrit and uh, Tibetan. And now we are getting uh, these uh, texts uh, restored gradually. Uh, particularly, we have a Tibetan history of higher studies in uh, Sarnath, which is uh, undertaking this particular task uh, under Ministry of Culture. So, Tibet uh, became a repository of Buddhist thought produced in India. And same is the case with China. We have many such uh, works, Buddhist texts, uh, which are not available in India in Sanskrit, but they are available in translation in uh, China. Because uh, Kumaraji uh, translated many manuscripts, Yuan Song translated many manuscripts, and thereafter also there were many Chinese scholars who translated Buddhist texts in Chinese. In fact, uh, in uh, Japan also, we have uh, very good scholars, even in modern times, who are studying Buddhist texts. And therefore, uh, uh, just one minute. Hello? May I be meeting me? So, there has been tremendous flow of uh, Indian philosophical thought. And it was not just Buddhism. Well, uh, we have a literature of Nyai Vaishishik system also available in uh, China. Uh, we have a Sankhya and Yoga literature also available in China. Uh, later on, Vedantic thought also had uh, its influence on uh, Asian mind. The point therefore is that uh, we have uh, an appreciable number of uh, Indian philosophical text available in translation in Asian countries. And uh, it's not a matter of pride, but it's a matter of uh, both satisfaction and academic uh, enterprise that we should know as to how Indian philosophical thought could go to these countries. Well, Indian, the spread of Indian culture was not through sword, not by force. It was uh, a willing acceptance by both uh, the masses as also the rulers. Many kings were protectors of uh, Vedic religion and also Buddhist religion. Buddhism was accepted, uh, for example, in Korea as a state religion also. And uh, it is a time that uh, there is uh, more and more cultural exchanges between uh, India and uh, Asian countries in particular. Of course, uh, we don't, I don't want to dichotomize that Asia and uh, Europe and America, but uh, uh, since uh, we are part and parcel of the Asian uh, uh, continent, therefore uh, there is more affinity. We are cultural cousins, I would put it like that. And therefore, uh, the cousins should uh, come together and constitute uh, a, an extended uh, family and uh, 
there should be more and more such exchange, ex exchanges. That's why we are uh, organizing these uh, Asian uh, philosophical conferences. And we hope that uh, these conferences will continue to be held and uh, we shall have more and more interaction for our, not only for our mutual benefit, but also for the well-being of the entire human race. Because the ideas and ideals propagated in Indian culture are for universal good, not for Indian soul. We, we don't say God bless India. We say God bless the whole humanity. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhina, that has been our ideal and I hope uh, that uh, we shall uh, enhance this ideal and practice it also. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Sir, you have given a very good information that uh, I think, at least I never knew it, maybe others would know it, but it's a very valuable information. So now I will call first speaker, Professor Ravi Chandran Murthy, University of Kabangsan, Malaysia. Please greet our uh, speaker with claps. Professor Bath, uh, the chairman of the session, uh, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. On the outside, let me thank the organizers for the invitation for me to be here today. Um, it's, I've been in, involved in the, actually, bioethics fraternity in India for the last 10 years uh, through UNESCO uh, with collaboration with Professor Panir Silvam. And uh, that collaboration has brought me to many places in India. Uh, and now I'm here for the first time in Mumbai, in, 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 in Surat, sorry. In Surat. Um, Professor Bhatt mentioned about very succinctly, about uh, very clearly about the spread of Indian philosophy, uh, culture, uh, religion, and language to much part of Asia. Uh, so he was looking at more of the, the, the eastern part of Asia. Now, I come from a region. Of course, I'm of Indian origin. My parents, my grandparents migrated to Malaysia some 120 years ago. Um, so I'm a Malaysian in that sense. Um, there are two types of migration that happen uh, from India to much part of Southeast Asia. The first migration took place uh, during the 13th, 14th, 14th and 15th century. And these were the Indian traders. Uh, generally, they are the spice traders who left, the, uh, left India and uh, went to Far East, especially in Southeast Asia, right up to Ch uh, China, uh, Straits of Malacca, the South China Sea, uh, looking for trade. Eh? So trading was the, the instrument that brought religion, culture, value system to much part of not only the mainland Southeast Asia, the mainland Southeast Asia countries like um, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, and the good professor was mentioning, but also on the archipelagic Southeast Asia, which we call the Malay world, right? The Malay world, We're talking about the Indonesian archipelago, including Malaysia, all right? Right up to the Pacific Ocean, and of course, I, I do not know whether the Indian philosophy has spread to the Pacific Ocean, huh? to the Polynesian island and Melanesian island. Probably some people can do research in that as well. Now, I'm going to talk to you about uh, a small community, because the topic which was given, actually, the theme was actually the far-reaching influence of uh, Indian philosophy right, in other regions. So I'm going to talk to you about a small community of Indians. This is not the second generation of migration that my forefathers came, but a few hundred years before that, all right, in the 19, uh, uh, sorry, in the 15th century, uh, a group of people called the Chittis, all right, and these are, they were traders. They were actually traders. Let me just go to, okay. They were actually traders, and they were trading, and those days, 
trading was very much dependent on the monsoon all right the very much dependent on the monsoon so they will be traveling for a couple of months in southeast asia and they have to wait for another 6 months before they could return to south to to india all right and a group of people decided to marry the locals the local malays the javanese the batak people of southeast asia and uh, they began to take domicile they start to stay and eventually this group of people cut off because of the caste issues and being you know married uh, to other people they cut off their relations with india so eventually they became a kind of a hybrid community very interesting a hybrid community and they are somewhere in malaysia if you know malacca many of you may have been to malacca the straits of malacca is named after the state which i was born called malacca all right and that is the port city in the 19 uh, sorry in the 14th and 15th century the, the, the and these people domicile in that area uh, so i'm going to talk to you about these people uh, the chitis okay who are the malacca chitis all right we call them the malacca chitis all right these are the group of people who have been there from the 15th century largely spice traders okay um as malacca became more prominent in the malay archipelago growing number of traders including the hindus from the coromandel coast visited many ports in southeast asia including the malacca port okay now as i mentioned to you through intermarriages between the hindu traders and the malay the chinese the javanese the bata all right became more frequent thus the malacca chitti community was born the malacca chitti community looks a bit different from the usual way that the indian look all right uh you know we we have chinese looking indians right those who are from assam and shillong that area and they look a bit of a mix as well so you know the, so you can't really the, the facial characteristics is is no longer indian per se but there are some mixture with the with the, with the local culture now what is interesting about this community that i need to tell you this community have lost many of their systems or traditions all right so what they have they have adapted all right they have adapted they have lost the language so they do not speak any indian languages okay uh they only speak the malay language they adapted to that as well all right the way that they attire themselves are malay attire they have songs and rituals who are all uh, accustomed to malay but they have remained steadfastly as hindus and there is a very old temple one of the oldest temple in malaysia which is the pudaya vinayagar temple in uh, goldsmith street in malacca is actually belongs to this community of course now it is run by the the wealthier the chatiar community but it belongs to that community so very interesting although they have lost or they have adapted uh, language um, you know other aspects like food clothings and uh, in, even uh, you know because of the intermarriages they don't look like indians but they have maintained the value system pertaining to religion all right and together with it the caste system all right and it's very interesting there are only about 200 of them left in malacca all right they they live in a small uh, village i will show you the village soon after this this is the village i think you can see in the screen that's the entrance to the village you have the elephant statue elephant is called because that place is called gaja berang gaja means elephant berang means angry angry elephant village and that is the land given by the dutch so there are about 200 families there all right they still reside in that that area there are about this is the uh, this is this was taken about 5 years ago when i did my research in that community that's me with the blue shirt and there is a community leaders okay so very interesting the way that they speak they speak malay language there's no indian slang that's nothing indian about them except for their names they also have two names they have one 
Tamil or Indian name as well as one Malay name. All right? Very interesting uh, community. And these are some of their people. Um, uh, who, you see the way that they attire themselves. These are the community leaders. All right? The last leader has also, Tega Raja has also have, uh, passed on, passed away. Now, this is the adornment. You see, the way that they attire themselves, they have adopted, they have embraced their local culture. In fact, their language is also has been different. But they are also steadfast Hindus. There is a temple uh, within the community. Uh, I've got the name of the temple. Uh, it's an Amman temple, right? And uh, in Malay, we call Datuk Chacha. Datuk Chacha here meaning... Uh, Whenever people get this chicken pox or, you know, they will go, after that they will go to that temple. It's very, quite a famous... Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> All right. You know, so very interesting. I've been to that temple. Uh, all the rituals are done in Malay, but they have a, a Hindu priest from India. So the, 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 you know, the recitation of the hymns and things of that will be in Sanskrit done by an Indian priest. So this is the culture. Uh, they still maintain uh, the Hindu culture. Okay, now these are some of the things. And they also have what we call village, because they were the agrarian, they used to be traders, then became uh, uh, farmers. So they also have temples in the uh, fields. In Tamil, you call Gramya Kuil. I don't know what's the other thing. That means, uh, but if you go to that place, there's, there is no, there's no farming land. It's in the middle of the city, right? But you still have certain structures, okay? <clears throat> now, these are some of the celebration. And this house here that you can see, that's, that's actually a Hindu house. Uh, sorry, the Malacca Chitti house. And now it's made into a museum. And that is the temple. Uh, that's, a, that's a temple within the, the state of Malacca. Okay. Now, let me come back to the... The, 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 uh, my argument, which I'm trying to make here, is despite the, um, how do you say, despite years of adaptation and embracing a more dominant culture, which is the Malay culture, okay, they have maintained certain world, worldview, which is predominantly, I would say, an Indian-based worldview. All right? Why do I say that? Okay? Now, uh, this is this some of my findings. Uh, uh, other than religion and the philosophy of Indian, I'm not sure how, how philosophical they are, but they are embracing the, the Indian religion or the Hindu religion in that sense, has kept them, although distinct from other people, all right? they, they always think of themselves as an heritage community. Uh, they also do not really think of themselves as the dominant Tamil community there, all right? So therefore, they maintain their identity, all right, as separate from other Indian ethnicity in Malaysia. But in the same time, they are able to say that, hey, look here, I'm also a Hindu. All right? I think that's quite an interesting uh, uh, finding. All right? Their worldview is essentially a village worldview, all right? basically centers around temple activities, family functions, also local squabbles. I've seen quarrels between, uh, you know, com temple committee. You know, I've uh, observed from far how they quarrel. Uh, of course, everybody quarrels in the temple community. I'm sure in India as well. And they they quarrel with a different Malay, with the Malay language. You know, I was quite, uh, <laughs> you know, surprised the way that they were quarrelling. Huh? They speak very beautiful Malay language. You know, so basically, this is actually identity. So their identity is a non-Indian. They do not see themselves as Indian, but they, they see themselves as a Chitti community, as a community on their own, as a hybrid community, all right, which is religiously Indian. All right, they are Hindus. All right, uh, okay, let me just go through the concept of modernization. Okay. Now, essentially, they are not business people now, and there are no political leaders or rather uh, prominent leaders that come from this community. Okay? Uh, so, they were usually uh, clerical workers. Some of them have migrated to Singapore, all right? So, it is a dwindling kind of uh, diminishing community. Because more so, because they are. They 
cannot identify themselves with a major uh, religion or a major community, they tend to intermarry. Many of them marry the Tamilians. So then the following generation will eventually become Tamils in that sense. Okay? Um, so, but they are trying their best to maintain culture. The government also recognized this community as a distinct from other Tamil communities, right? So therefore, they have certain privileges. Now, again, these are the, some of the findings that I had about the global values. Uh, let me just talk to you about this concept of Bhumiputra in Malaysia. And a lot of you know about this concept of preferential treatment. So this community also requests, or rather, they demand for that special status. The government have not given them the status yet, but they have given other privileges. Uh, but they think of themselves, they say they are not the, the Indians who came in the 17th century and the 18th century, who worked in the plantations, but they were distinct, all right? And in fact, these are the people, initial people, who contributed to the economy of the state of Malacca in that sense. Many of these people, some of them became uh, in the early days, uh, were Bandaharas or the prime ministers. Bandahara means prime minister of Malacca. They were Muslims nevertheless, some of them, all right? So they have contributed to the political system, the economic system of the country. Okay. Uh, no. So some of the challenges that they speak um, with the community, I would like to go beyond that and also talk to you about something else. Um, go beyond Malacca and also talk about Malaysia and Indonesia. I'll take this opportunity if I have the time. Do I have how many more minutes? Are? I, 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 huh? Two to three minutes, okay. Now, Professor Bart rightfully mentioned the spread of Indian philosophy, essentially through religion, uh, to many parts of the archipelagic. And if you were to look at Malaysia and Indonesia pretty much, the challenges are there. Although, although right now, you know, I mean, in grandeur, in retrospect, we talk good about it. But there are challenges as well, all right? Challenges essentially coming from Islamization of Southeast Asia. Right? Um, while the Hindu philosophy embraces everybody and things of that sort, there is also challenges, especially in Malaysia, uh, that you find that the Malays who were um, at one time Hindus and Buddhists, uh, I don't say totally rejecting, but feel that they are Indian heritage or Indian past is not so important, all right? I see, we see that also happening in Indonesia, but Indonesia is a bit more open society because probably because of their socialist, socialist ideology earlier, all right? Um, they are embracing more. So you, you find that if you go to Yogyakarta and Perambangan, where you have the Borobudur and all that, they have, you know, very Hindu-Buddhist kind of, uh, Hindu worship, like, for example, worship of volcanoes. Although while they are Muslims, all right, they are Muslims, but also they have Indian rituals, all right, or Indian-based ritual that exist together with the religion, okay? And I think that eventually will go off also. Uh, that's, that's, that's my reading coming from the region. Okay, I think I'm going to stop here. And uh, thank you for listening. I'll take some questions after that. Thank you very much, Professor Ravi Chandran Murthy. Now I invite Professor Dang Ming Jun, School of Philosophy, Fudin University, Shanghai, People's Republic of China. We welcome our speaker with claps. Uh, thank you very much for Professor Bart and for the conference to invite me to, uh, to Surat. And uh, I'm sincerely honored to have a presentation here. Uh, the, the name of my presentation today is Hedovidia uh, in Chinese Buddhist logic. And uh, my paper is a little bit long and involves some uh, technical methods. 
uh, and uh, in this 20 minutes, I will just uh, read uh, the first part. The first part, part is a brief history of the Chinese tradition, of the Chinese head video tra tradition. By, Chinese, by, the, by, the, by the term Chinese, I do not mean China geographically, but means the tradition was mainly uh, written, uh, the text in the tradition was mainly composed in Chinese, either by, China, either by scholars in China, or scholars in Korea, or scholars in Japan. So, uh, in Ming, uh, Hitu Vidya, in, in Ming, or Japanese in Mio, is Chinese tra is translation of the Sanskrit word Hitu Vidya, which means literally the science of reason. This is a name of logic, or rather of the theory of reasoning and argument. In a famous Buddhist enclosi, uh, encyclopedic work, Yoga Jara Bumi, compiled by Asanga. Uh, five videos are enumerated there. They are five basic disciplines in medieval in India, according to the account of Xuanzang. The five videos are, the, at first, uh, the Shabda Vidya, the science of grammar, and uh, the second, uh, Shilpa Karma Stana Vidya, the science of manual craft, the third, uh, Jigit Sa Vidya, the science of medicine, the fourth, the Hedu Vidya, the science of reason, and the fifth, the last, uh, uh, Adhyatma Vidya, the inner science, philosophy. Just as Hedu Vidya is classified separately from Adhyatma Vidya, uh, from, from philosophy in the above list, logic being different from philosophical and religious dogmas is are too common to all the schools of Indian philosophy and available for any intellectual activity in classical India. It has a long history of more than one and a half millennia dating from the beginning of the common era. Various schools of Indian philosophy, for example, Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Sankhya, Jainism, and Buddhism, etc., contributed to its development, and it was studied under different titles like Anvik Shiki, Vata, Nyaya, Dharga, and later Brahmana, etc. Hedu Vidya was only one name among them. The first, as we know, the first systematic presentation of Indian logic is the Nyaya Sutra, which is the classic of the Nyaya school. The first systematic presentation of Hedu Vidya is found in one chapter from Yogacara Bhumi, the Hedu Vidya Sthana. The chapter was only one of many competing menus on logic in its times, yet no substantial contribution was given to this field in this chapter. Logic under the qualification as Buddhist about one century later through the intellectual efforts of Dignaga. It was Dignaga who wrote, who wrote a lot of important works of, on logic. Of them, there were at first the Hedu Chakra Damaru, the drum well of reason, and then the Nyaya Mukha, entrance to method, and at last, the Brahmana Samjaya, the compendium on means of valid cognition. In them, he advocated a theory of reasoning which signified a remarkable movement towards the idea of formal logic. By formal logic, we mean a theory where argument can be evaluated as reliable or not in a general way. Scholars after Dignaga, whatever scholastic affiliation they might bear, could make no progress in this field unless they took into consideration Dignaga theories, either following or criticizing them, but absolutely not neglecting them. Hence, Dignaga was praised by modern Indian authors as the father of medieval logic. The Hedovidya tradition in China was mainly established by Xuanzang and his disciples. Although there were at least two translated texts on logic in Chinese Buddhist literature before Xuanzang, namely the Fang Bian Xing Lun, the Bra Yoga Sara, or the Upaya Hridaya, and the uh, Ru Shi Lun, Targa Shastra, they left no impression on the Chinese mind. 
When Xuan Zhang arrived in, at Chang'an in 645, he brought back 600, uh, 600 40, and 47 works from India. Among them, there were 36 works on logic, but only two were translated into Chinese by him. They were the Nyaya Bravesha of Shankara Swami and the Nyaya Mukha of Dignaga. Being translated in 647 and 649, respectively. In the same period, the Yogajaran Bhumi was also translated by him from 646 to 648. It was estimated that the translation of Nyaya Bravesha and the Nyaya Mukha was to provide supplementary materials for understanding the Hedvidya chapter of Yogajara Bhumi. In fact, the name Hedvidya can be found only in Yogajara Bhumi among Indian literature and logic we know today. The term has never taken place in any work of Dignaga and Shankara Swami we, know to, we have today. The two characters, Ying Ming, leading the Chinese title of both Nyaya Mukha and Nyaya Bravesha, namely uh, Ying Ming Zhen Li Meng Lun and the Ying Ming Ru Zhen Li Lun, were added by Xuan Zhang himself, perhaps with the aim of showing the doctrinal affinity of these two works to the head video chapter of Yogacara Bhumi. Also, the theory elaborated in the form in the Nyaya Bravesha and the Nyaya Mukha, uh, and that in the Yogacara Bhumi were remarkably different. Nevertheless, Yogajara Bhumi was one of the most authoritative pieces of, of the Yogajara school in East Asia. Xuan Zhang was actually the initiator of this school. The text abided a central place in Xuan Zhang's career as a preacher of the Yogajara Buddhism. Therefore, it might be safe to say that the name Hedvidya was deliberately chosen by Xuan Zhang himself as a general title given to the Buddhist doctrines of reasoning and argument. In this sense, the Chinese tradition can be regarded as a Hedvidya tradition in, contest, in contrast with the Brahmana tradition in Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. When Xuan Zhang studied in India, he learned the Nyaya Bravesha, Brahmana Samjaya, and, and the Nyaya Mukha for many times and the different teachers on different occasions. Moreover, before his leaving for China, he successfully established the Yogacara idealist standard by means of an influence in a great debate held by King Shila Aditya in Kanya Gupta. The famous influence, uh, the influence for consciousness only, was later renowned as a truthful influence for consciousness only. Now, at the same time when Xuan Zhang translated Nyaya Mukha and the Brahmana and the Nyaya Bravesha, he had oral in explanations of the texts to his translation team and the disciples. The first generation of authors in China on Hedvidya emerged out of the audience. They wrote commentaries on these two treatises on the basis of Xuan Zhang's teachings. With regard to Xuan Zhang's learning experiences in India, we could imagine how substantial his oral explanations of Buddhist logic would be. There were about 20 works on logic out of the first generation. However, only four survived. They are Shen, Shen Tai's commentary on Nyaya Mukha, incomplete, and Wen Gui's commentary on Nyaya Bravesha, and the Jing Yan's con two works. Uh, these two works combined together form a complete commentary on Nyaya Bravesha. They are first-hand materials for us to know Xuan Zhang's teachings of Buddhist logic. Uh, Kui Ji uh, belonged to the second generation. He based his commentary on Nyaya Bravesha on not only works of the first generation, but also what Xuan Zhang later taught him separately. This made his work a grand synthesis of Hedvidya doctrines handed down by Xuan Zhang. The work was renowned as the great commentary on Hedvidya in this tradition. Most works on Hedvidya after him were either in the form of commentary on it or as studies on certain topics in it. This is the case for not only his disciple and grand disciple, Hui Zhao and Zhi Zhou, but also the followers of the Hedvidya tradition in Japan. In contrast to works before Kui Ji, 
uh, the great commentary on Hedovidia is far more comprehensive. The interpretations herein are more sophisticated. It bears much ambition of building a system of Buddhist logic. The works before him now sorted as old commentaries in contrast with Kweiji's great commentaries. The old commentaries are less systematic and more like notes of Xuanzang's oral interpretations. However, we cannot safely attribute the elaborations which are not found in the old commentaries, but only in the great commentary to Kuiji himself, because Kuiji was said to be taught by Xuanzang separately. Uh, furthermore, the head of their transition is not only uh, yes. It's not only a Chinese one, but also a tradition of Buddhist logic in the East Asian world. On one hand, when Xuanzang arrived in Chang'an, he had already, there had already been brilliant monk scholars from Korea. For example, the famous Wang Chu. He became Xuanzang's disciple and was among the first generation of authors in China on Hedovidia. Dao Jun came from Korea, studied under Wang Chu, and came back then. Tai Hyung was Dao, Dao Jun's disciple in Korea. Wong Hyo had never been in China, was an insightful scholar on this subject. He was famous for his counterargument against Xuanzang's influence for consciousness only. All of the four scholars had works on Buddhist logic. On the other hand, Hedovidya was brought, brought to Japan through Dao Shou and Genbo, both studied in China. Uh, they initiated respectively the South Temple tradition, Nanjiden, and the North Temple tradition, Hakujiden, of Hedovidya studies in Japan. Of the Hedovidya scholars in medieval Japan, the most famous two were Zenju and Zhao Xun. The first authored the, the, a lamp of the great commentary on Hedovidya, the latter, the notes on the great commentary on Hedovidya. These two voluminous pieces are indispensable aids for us to understand not only Kuiji, but also numerous Hedovidya authors before and after Kuiji, whose works have already lost and been, and only fragments are kept as citations here and there in these two pieces, as well as in many other works composed by monk scholars in medieval Japan. Uh, As mentioned above, the two fundamental texts of the tradition are Nyaya Mukha and Nyaya Bravesha. Xuanzang, the author, or uh, Shankara Swami, the author of Nyaya Bravesha, was said to be a disciple of the Ignaga. Uh, only five minutes. Mm. Uh, his Nyaya Bravesha, following the framework of Nyaya Mukha, was a summary of the Ignaga's theory of logic. However, so what was taught by Xuanzang was not limited to the theories elaborated in these two treatises. He even in reinterpreted the texts according to later views expressed in Dignaga's last magnum opus, the Brahmana Samjaya, and expanded the texts from the perspective of new developments even after Dignaga. Uh, I will show this maybe uh, in my third presentation. Uh, meanwhile, around the seventh century in India, Buddhist logic was transformed by Dharma Girdi in the form of reinterpreting the Ignaga. Through his transformation, various dialectical considerations were given, uh, were removed from Buddhist logic, while more ontological and epistemological bearings were given to it. It was Dharma Girdi's logic that prevailed among later Indian Buddhists to the, dis to the disappearance of Buddhism in India around the 13th century. His works were transmitted to Tibetan and formed the basis of Tibetan Buddhist logic. He was the major figure, figure in the Indian and the Tibetan Brahmana tradition. Scholars after him were used to understand the Dignaga through his eyes. However, his name was unknown to the Chinese until the late 7th century. He had no influence on Hedovidya tradition, therefore, as a working hypothesis, the Hedovidya tradition can be regarded as mainly a tradition following the Indian interpretation of Dignaga before Dharma Girdi. 
As a matter of fact, most of, of the monographs on Buddhist logic after Dignaga and before Dharmakirti do not survive today. They were shadowed by the success of Dharmakirti. Our knowledge about what happened to Indian Buddhist logic during this period depends to a great, to a great extent on what we can learn from the Hedavidya tradition. Nevertheless, as a precaution, we are not justified to attribute what was told in the, in the Hedavidya tradition to the Indians without textual evidence of any kind from the Indian side. Nor can we safely speak of a new development of Buddhist logic in China, even when we are failed to collect evidence from extant literature to prove its Indian authorship. We cannot know exactly what is Indian and what is Chinese on many occasions. The boundary is unclear. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Deng.